foot. Okay, everybody. Uh, my name is Sam Coster. I'm Seth Coster, and we are Butterscotch Shenanigans. We are an independent game studio from St. Louis, Missouri, which is not a place to be from around here. Uh, the cost of living is basically made to buy a bag of dirt a week, roughly, in terms of uh, keeping ourselves alive, which makes making indie games excellent because we have very little overhead. Uh, we have released two games so far. We've been in operation since last November, and we're not homeless yet, so we're calling ourselves experts on monetization. So, uh, with that in mind, uh, we do have two titles out as of now. The first one is called Talflight 2. It released in February of this year, won the top rated um, Android game of March, and one of the top rated Android games of the first quarter. And it was a financial failure. Yeah. Our last game, Quadros Rampage, came out in June, just crossed a million downloads as of last week. Um, it's been the thing that's keeping us alive, uh, which is primarily what we're going to talk about today. And our primary distinction for that one is we got Reddit's number 16 of the top 25 Android games of all time list uh, last week. Which is pretty awesome. So, um, we have been rigorously applying what we've been learning from failing really, really hard um, in an attempt to not die. We are bootstrapped, so we are doing all of this ourselves. We are not having outside investment. We do not spend any money on marketing. Um, so we are going to be operating this slightly antagonistic uh, presentation style with what has been said to the death. Yeah, yeah, we can do that. So, um, with that being said, you know, we uh, during development we asked ourselves a lot of questions. Like we said, our first game was a paid game, and with that we had a bunch of assumptions about how we need to monetize, how we cannot monetize. We come from a hardcore gaming background, and frankly hated in-app purchases and premium models. Um, that was before we failed massively. Um, <laughs> when we look back at it, we start asking ourselves the question: Okay, how do we balance? How do we balance game design and monetization? Um, because you know, everybody knows that in order to make money off of a game, it has to be monetized well, right? That's true. It does have to be monetized well. Uh, but isn't it also true that if your user interface looks like crap and is really clunky, it's also going to be hard to make money off that game? Yeah, that's probably a fact. Yeah. And I mean, if the core mechanic sucks, you're going to have a hard time making money off of it as well. Yeah. Right? Same so sort of trend I'm trying to, I'm trying to say. I guess the point I'm trying to get at is uh, maybe, maybe monetization is not actually separate from game design. You know, we often kind of. We relegate it as though it's something that exists outside and we only sort of subject our games to it when absolutely necessary because we know that it's just going to crap all over our game and just alienate users and it's just going to be awful, right? Uh, but we know that you know you have to have a good game to make money, you have to have a good UI, good art style, good music, all that stuff. Monetization is going to be different. Uh, so we propose that it exists alongside your game design as a core component of it. Um, and that if you if you view it as something separate and you try to, you're always asking the question, how do we balance uh, monetization against our game design to do as little harm as possible? Uh, what you're basically doing is you're enacting a self-fulfilling prophecy where you're going to probably set up a monetization scheme that hurts your game and therefore you are really needed to just trying to balance it. So when you take a step back and you actually view monetization as part essentially of the holistic gaming experience that you as a developer are crafting, alongside with UI or anything else, um, taking a step and looking at that question that we asked originally, how do I balance game design and monetization, um, it becomes clear that that's just the wrong question to ask. Because you can slot out monetization with any other component of making a good game. Art, UI, set design, whatever else. If you, fail at, one part, stupid. If you sure. fail at one part, then you're going to fail at the entire thing. So with that in mind, uh, why, don't we, why don't we take a little trip down memory road. Memory road. Memory road. Memory road. Memory road. And uh, check out Quadros Rampage, uh, which we made in June, which is holding that. So, Quadros Rampage, as we said, is across a million downloads. It's an endless rope like brawler. Uh, it's a little odd, we've got a very odd, offbeat sense of humor. Um, and we got praised for being one of the, quote, best implemented um, IAP models, or free models on the App Store by viewers, basically because we tried desperately not to shank people and take their money in the dark. So, um, <laughs> that being said, we did mess up in a lot of ways, right? Uh, like I said, we've been doing this for 10 months. Our first game was paid. We didn't really know what we were doing. And uh, really what we did when we monetized the game is we actually built it, and we built it in 10 weeks. Uh, and the final week, we said, okay, now we need this thing to make money. Who's been doing something kind of similar, and how can we just duct tape that on here? Because we have no idea what we're doing. Right, so we looked at, uh, so I mean, our game is basically, it's an endless game. Uh, and so we looked at other endless games, like Temple Run is a great example, right? Um, and we noticed they have a progression system. We have a progression system. Uh, you collect stuff and become more powerful. Great, we'll just bootstrap that right into our game. No problem, right? Except for one key distinction, uh, which is that our game does actually have an ending. It's a soft ending in that 
we have a boss fight. Uh, you go down into the depths of the ocean, you fight this boss, and it takes a really, really long time for most players to get there, maybe 15 hours or something like that. Uh, but they do get there eventually, and they kill him, and once they kill the boss, a lot of players kind of feel like they've beaten the game and they can now retire, right? So essentially what we did uh, was we did self-progression, just like Temple Run or any of these other games did, but by putting this huge goalpost uh, of this god named Pete, who's a total ass bag, by putting him out in the deeps, um, and allowing players to go kill him. When we sold progression, really what we were doing is we, you know, we took 10 weeks to make this huge ornate garden and lay these cobblestone bricks for people to walk through, and then we just gave them a freaking lawnmower, right? We just said, go straight to the end line without any sort of regard. <laughs> Ignore all this game made, just go right to the end. Just get there. And so what we found uh, was obviously that the question of how do we balance game design and monetization made us think, how do we make this progression fast enough by nature that it's not frustrating, uh, but slow enough that you might just want to give us a few bucks to skip ahead. And so obviously, by asking that question, we set up in ourselves a self-fulfilling prophecy to create an antagonistic relationship between game design and monetization. So if you want to think about what basically what we were selling players, uh, we basically sold them a way out of the game. Uh, so just kind of, you know, this, this talks about game design and monetization. So this is, this is our lesson of, uh, I wouldn't call it failure, we still make a little bit of money off of that aspect of our game. Uh, but we probably shouldn't have. Uh, and so ultimately, you know, if you're, if you're monetizing progression like that, you need to make sure that you're selling people a shortcut to the end game content and not to the end of your game, because that's, obviously that's bad. Yeah. So. so the second system we implemented uh, was after launch. We, of course, had a huge spike in downloads, revenue, whatever else, and then after about four days, you know, it starts drifting downwards and we went into panic mode. So we're like, okay, let's just step back. Let's ask a different question. What would just be so freaking awesome if we put in this game, that someone would just give us a few bucks just to hold it, and just to interact with it. <laughs> and after, it turns out know, that's the right question to ask. That is the right question to ask. So uh, after we stepped back, we took three days and added in a whole new pet system. So in the game, you actually have a pet starfish named Bingo, who's a sociopath and frisbees around and kills people. I call starfish. Uh, <laughs> they just usually aren't that capable. So um, what we did is we extrapolated from that, because everybody would comment on how much they love this little murderer. Um, so we built five more of these uh, creatures and put them in. The first one, named Bucket, is a walrus that shoots explosive buckets out of space. Like I said, we make weird stuff. So um, we saw our revenue double, uh, actually a little bit more than double after that, and it has actually stayed sustainably high since. Now, if you think about what we've been saying in terms of game design versus monetization, when you look at this as adding a new experience to the game, what we had essentially done was we did it right with this piece of the puzzle, right? We had, added a branch for people to interact with in the game. Yes, it would have sped up the progression a little bit, made the game a little bit easier, but mainly it was almost more of a flavor sort of thing, to give you a companion on your journey. And so what we did was we actually made money, we gave the players something new to interact with, we gave them good value for their dollar, and we did not shortcut the original, short circuit the original game design. So in a sense, the experiences were the only piece of things that we sold in the store that were actually congruent with our game design. And if you look back at it, then it makes perfect sense that that is still to this day the thing that's really keeping us alive. And then the third thing we did, so we, you know, this was our first free play game. So we, we kept experimenting a little bit with it. And we thought, hey, a lot of games do skins and customization and stuff like that. So let's do that. So we added some, we added five skins into the game, uh, which is a pretty easy thing to do. You know, it's just a cosmetic switch. Uh, so that you can customize your pet starfish, Bingo, who is a sociopath. Uh, so what we found with that is that uh, that actually did okay. Uh, not great. It was, a, it was a marginal boost to our revenue, but ultimately what we discovered is, you know, kind of what we had suspected all along, which is that in a single player game, customization is not a huge priority for players. Because there, there are social pressures in a multiplayer game for people to show off to their buddies, talk their opponents with the stupid hat that they're wearing, you know, all of that stuff. And of course, in a single player game, you just don't have that pressure. So it did okay for us, but it wasn't, you know, wasn't our top selling thing. So then taking a step back after all this quad push shenanigans happened, um, we realized that, as I said, the thing that we really needed to be selling um, only came when we stepped back and asked the right question. And everything that we sold kind of broke down. And I say sold, I don't say monetized. If you're building an in-game store, you're selling things. Door-to-door -door vacuum salesmen don't monetize vacuums. They sell vacuums, right? So you have to realize that as a game developer, if you have an in-app purchase store, you are a businessman, you're a salesman, and you're selling things. And if you try to get pennies on the dollar for vacuums or vacuum service, you can guess how good that would go have to offer an actual value to your players. So we realized that basically we had three different categories of stuff that we've experimented with thus far. We haven't touched consumables yet. Uh, we're aiming to do that in our next title. 
But we have experiences, uh, progression you can sell, and customization you can sell. And for us, one of the most congruent with the game design experiences has been the knockout hit for us. Exactly. And so basically what we've, what we've done over the course of our, you know, our existence in the studio is we've transitioned from not even wanting to touch monetization, or rather not, or uh, in-app purchases, to trying to embrace it but doing it kind of badly, and then actually taking a step back and thinking about it in the proper terms. Because as Sam said, we do have to recognize that we are not just game developers, we are salesmen because we need to make money so that we can continue delivering quality stuff to our players. You know, it's not unethical, it's not equal to make money uh, as long as you are giving your players something that they really want, that they want to give you money for, right? And so, you know, our mindset has basically shifted from, oh God, we have to monetize, to, to uh, you know, now that we know that we have to make money, uh, how can we make the money work for us instead of making it work against us? Yeah. Which is basically kind of like that one map book. I love that one. Yeah. yeah, it's like uh, walking the club like No, <laughs> no, it's not that. It's the uh, make the money. Don't let the money make you. No. <laughs> That's it. Thank you guys.